winter is coming and so is that new pandemic plan from the White House right as we're finding out more about two cases of Omicron additionally here in the US. We already knew about California. Now we know about one in Minnesota and another in Colorado. Both of those people traveling just recently and listen this isn't totally unexpected but it's still significant. We've got a reality check with the former head of the CDC on this show. Plus we're live at the White House with the details of what's changing now with the president's new COVID strategy. And we'd learned just right before coming on the air that, listen to this, some 60 schools are shut down in Michigan because of what police are calling a tidal wave of copycat threats from that horrific school shooting this week. We're going one-on-one -on -one with the sheriff there coming up in just a minute. And we're all over some other breaking news out west where police in Beverly Hills say they've arrested a suspect in the killing of Jacqueline Avant, the wife of a legendary music producer who's getting tributes now from a former president and from Oprah. Plus, tonight's original takes us to Lake Tahoe, where a shift in snow season could mean major changes to how we visit and enjoy one of the country's most beautiful spots. And more drama in the saga of Peng Shui, the Women's Tennis Association pulling out of tournaments in China altogether because they're so worried about her. So why is the International Olympic Committee saying she's actually fine? Hey, I'm Hallie, and we're starting off in Colorado because the governor there tweeted only about an hour or so ago that a woman in that state tested positive for the Omicron variant of COVID after she got home from Southern Africa. And listen, even though this is case number three in the U.S., almost everybody's saying this was only a matter of time, right? Don't freak out. That has been the message consistently, including from the president, who, Omicron or not, had already been working on a strategy to make what we all expect to be a winter surge not quite so surgy. Here he is. It's the com combined advice from all of you that we developed this plan. And it doesn't include shutdowns or lockdowns, but widespread vaccinations and boosters and testing and a lot more. President Biden also wants all of us to think about getting vaccinated as a patriotic responsibility rather than a political act. And those vaccinations, really important, being talked about even more so now with Omicron in those three states we mentioned. Minnesota's one of them. That state's health department says the person who tested positive there probably caught the Omicron variant from an anime convention in New York. 53,000 other people also went to that convention. The CDC is investigating all of it. We're going to talk to former acting CDC director Dr. Richard Besser about that in just a second. But first, I want to get to Heidi Presbola, who's joining us from just outside the National Institutes of Health. So, Heidi, um, it's good to have you on the show. Thank you. Let's talk about this nine-point plan from President Biden. We've heard some of this before, right? Masks on planes, that's not new. That's going to be extended. Tightening travel restrictions. You've also got the president pushing this campaign to get 100 million million adults boosted, right? Really leaning into existing strategies, Hallie. It's essentially more shots, more tests. On the shots, a nationwide campaign to try and get more people to get boosters, specifically seniors who could be at highest risk for most severe disease, but also these family vaccination clinics in order to encourage more children to get vaccinated so we don't see the kind of school shutdowns that we saw last year. And then testing, the president wanting to quadruple testing, including requiring private insurers, Hallie, to fund those tests, essentially make them free. Uh, a lot of questions there on how that reimbursement would work. And then also testing on airlines, requiring international travelers as of next week to, to get a negative test within one day of flying to the United States, Hallie. How is the White House responding? Because listen, anything the president does, anything any president does is going to probably inevitably get some criticism. How is the White House responding to complaints that this plan doesn't actually go far enough? Well, they say they are doing what they can given the powers that they have. You see what is what they, what they are dealing with with these vaccination mandate pushbacks. For instance, they're being challenged in Congress. There's talk of a shutdown over it, even uh, challenged in the courts. And that compares, Hallie, to what's going on overseas, which is really a very different approach. I spoke with a global health CEO who operates in 90 different countries, and here's how she compared our approach here to what's happening, for instance, in the European Union. Take a listen. The U.S. is lagging behind. We have an administration that has not uh, given the same consistent managers, messages throughout all these year and a half, two years, and we don't see enough actions. 
And the question, Hallie, is uh, what are some of these additional levers then that the president can right. pull here, given that we are a federalist system, right? So it's really a state-based system. We can't have a national vaccine mandate like some of these other countries. That's a good point. Heidi Presbilla, thank you so much for that great reporting. Appreciate you being with us. Let me bring in now uh, Dr. Richard Besser, former acting head of the CDC. Dr. Besser, it's good to see you again. Thank you for being on the show tonight. Thanks so much, Hallie. It's good to be here. So lots of questions for you. Let me start just for flow purposes where Heidi left off there, right? Details of the president's plan. In your professional assessment, do you think this is the absolute best defense, given what we know now, against the winter surge that we expect will happen? Yeah, I, I think these are these are very good measures. The the biggest challenge I see is that we're entering the the winter uh, at a time where there is incredible fatigue uh, around this pandemic, and so the the basic measures that we were all willing to do a year ago, wearing masks, mm -hmm. keeping distance, being really careful indoors, uh, checking to any symptoms to make sure you didn't have COVID. People are tired of doing all of those things, and it's coming at a time where you know we we talked about it before. In the winter, viruses do better. We're indoors. We're in closer contact. And if we're not upping our game, you know, regardless of what Omicron uh, is or does, uh, we will see uh, a, a bigger impact from Delta than we've 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 seen uh, or than we would need to see. You know, currently we are still losing about a thousand people in America every single day, yeah. and it, it seems to me that people are complacent about that. They've accepted that as 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 something we're okay with, and it shouldn't be because if if we could make vaccination a patriotic duty, something we do to protect ourselves, our families, our communities, the fabric of society, if, it could, if that could be the norm, we, the, it, it's hard to envision the number of lives that we could save. It's incredible to think about when you put it that way, Dr. Besser. I want to ask you about some of the details, because as you talk about, you know, the fight against the pandemic, I wonder what lessons, if any, at least right now, that you're drawing from what we know about these cases of Omicron in the U.S. so far, because the person who tested positive for Omicron in Minnesota was vaccinated and boosted. The woman in Colorado was vaccinated fully, but not boosted. And in all of these cases we've heard so far, the symptoms have been described as mild, right? What do you take away from that? Well, you know, I, I don't want to take away too much because it's only three you don't cases. want to generalize. Yeah, from yeah. From, from three cases, you don't want to you don't want to go too far. But you know, I, I feel much better than if you'd said there are three cases and they're all in the intensive care unit mm -hmm. because you know that would be very very concerning. Uh, if it turns out that Omicron causes milder infection than the Delta variant, uh, that would be a really good thing, especially if it spreads easier and if, and if we were able to see the Delta variant be replaced by a strain that causes less severe illness, and if we get protection from our current vaccines and previous infection, uh, at least partial protection, that wouldn't be a, a terrible thing. If, on the other hand, we find out that even though it's it's slightly more mild, uh, people are at risk who've been fully vaccinated, that would be real concerning. Thankfully, the technology we have around uh, these, these mRNA vaccines allows for very quick development of new vaccines. You know, protection would take time. But I, I do think being very cautious right now until we learn more is the right way to go. I would much rather have uh, people in the public say, wow, that was an overreaction, than saying, why didn't, why didn't they do more? Why didn't they do more yeah. when they could? I, and I feel like I'm getting some deja vu to the very early days of the pandemic, Dr. Besser, when that was the message even then, a year and a half ago, of, you know, we're on this precipice. Can we be overcautious and eventually say, wow, we went too far? Wouldn't that be the better case scenario? When you say be cautious right now, Dr. Besser, does that mean change your holiday travel plans? You know, Dr. Fauci says if you're vaccinated, enjoy the holidays. Um, do you agree with Dr. Fauci on that? Do we need to be rethinking things like traveling to see family for Christmas? Well, you know, it depends what your holiday travel plans were. If your holiday travel plans were gathering with a group of people and some people were vaccinated and some people weren't, I would change your holiday travel plans. Mm -hmm. And that has nothing to do with Omicron. That has to do with the fact that the virus does really well and there's a, you know, Delta variant spreads really, really easy. If, on the other hand, you're fully vaccinated, your whole family's vaccinated, uh, and you're traveling to visit relatives who are fully vaccinated, uh, and you, you, you're thinking about, well, maybe we'll get a test, uh, a home test kit before we all gather 
for that, that Christmas dinner or other big gathering? I say, yeah, go for it. That's, that's a, I think, a, a, re a relatively safe thing to do. A lot comes down to one's own risk tolerance yeah. and, and one's own risk. So if you, you're the people in your group who are at great risk of having severe disease because of their age or because of medical conditions, you want to treat it differently. But each person will have a different level of risk tolerance. Uh, and I think you have to listen to that and recognize that there may be people who are more comfortable doing things than, than you are. There may be people who are less comfortable. When we gathered at our house for Thanksgiving, uh, we asked each person person who was coming, everyone had to be vaccinated, but we asked people to, be, to test themselves that morning because we knew there were some people gathering who were a little less comfortable being with others if, if people weren't tested. I think that's, a, that's an interesting point. Smart idea. Dr. Richard Besser, great to have you on. Thank you so much for your expertise and for sharing with us, with us tonight. So as we're talking about the pandemic, and you heard Dr. Besser allude to it there, it's hard not to talk about politics, at least here in Washington, because that's what's going down over on Capitol Hill. And here's the deal. There's this government shutdown deadline tomorrow, and a deal to avoid that. Yay, right? Not so much. That's because some Senate Republicans say they're not going to go for it, at least not yet, because of President Biden's vaccine mandate. They want to try to stop that federal vaccine mandate, or at least try to. And they're tying the whole thing to the discussion around keeping the government open. You heard the president say today, listen, please, let's not politicize this. Here's what he said. COVID-19 has been very divisive in this country. It's become a political issue, which is a sad, sad commentary. Now, as we move into the winter and face the challenges of this new variant, this is a moment we can put the divisiveness behind us, I hope. Well, that is his hope, at least. Ali Vitale joins us now. So, Ali, let's bring us up to speed on where things are on Capitol Hill. I understand the House is about to vote. There's really not a huge question that this deal yeah. to avoid a government shutdown is going to make it through. The question is what's going down in the Senate, right? With yeah. this whole discussion from some Republicans about, well, wait a second, we want to throw a wrench in, in President Biden's vaccine mandate and we're going to link it to this issue. What's the latest? Yeah, Hallie, because you hear, and the way you laid this out was perfectly, because you hear that the House is about to pass a continuing resolution to fund the government, and it is a moment of yay, right. But that feels like it's the vibe here a lot when we come around deadlines on Capitol Hill, because there's usually something that gums up the process. And in this case, it's just a handful of conservative Republican senators who are saying that they don't want to speed this process up in the Senate, which means that the Senate going through its regular timetable misses the tomorrow night midnight deadline and basically forces a government shutdown. There's a difference between the kind of government shutdown we're going to see now. It's a weekend shutdown and likely not the same kind of prolonged pain that we've typically seen before. But it's a shutdown nonetheless, and it lends to the idea of dysfunction in D.C. on either side of this aisle right now. So can I, let me just ask a quick logistical question. And I, and I don't mean this in a glib way, Ali, and I think you know that. Like, OK, so the government shuts down for, let's say, the weekend and they fix things yeah. on Monday. Does that affect my life? Not really. What it does affect is if you're trying to go to a national park or a federally funded yeah. museum, a lot of those non-essential things that we see quickly happen. But as someone said to me today, they do sort of bake these deadlines in on Fridays on purpose, just in case something has to slip. <laughs> a shutdown over the weekend is actually better than a shutdown at any other point. And because this one is going to be so short, I'm not great at math, but what you can tell from what the Senate's timetable is, is that they need two days of intervening days between when the House passes this bill up until when the Senate can take it up. Again, those are the usual rules. Every senator can agree that they want to speed this process up, but that's not the reality right now because three of them at least say they're fine going through this and actually getting a shutdown, however temporarily. But boy, what does it say about the system, right, that they're baking in Friday deadlines knowing yeah. that members of Congress may not meet them? Um, Allie, really right. quickly here, Mitch McConnell, Senator Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate, is not really eye to eye with some of these other Senate Republicans on this whole fight over President Biden's vaccine mandate. No, and he has said that this doesn't help them politically. He said that he doesn't want to shut down, and he's even said that it's not going to shut down. Okay. Again, I'm not a math person, but I can do the basics of I don't see how you do a Senate timetable before tomorrow night's midnight deadline. Yeah. McConnell could come in and corral different parts of his caucus, but those efforts have already been underway. There are different mechanisms for these three senators to register their distaste of the vaccine mandate. That could come next week in a separate resolution 
resolution that they're already planning to vote on yeah. that has nothing to do with funding the government. But that hasn't worked so far to placate them. So this is where we are, despite the fact that most Republicans that I talk to and you talk to agree that there's no political upside for them, and Democrats agree with this too, in shutting down the government. Ali Vitale, live for us there on the Hill tonight. Ali, um, not a math major, we got it, but you are very good at journalism. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. So listen, we, we've talked about what happened on Tuesday in Michigan, something incredibly awful with that school shooting that left four students dead. And what's happening now, it's upsetting. There's this wave of copycat threats shutting down, listen to this, some 60 schools in Michigan, most of them in the county where this shooting happened. The sheriff there just told reporters at the point where they have to call in help from the FBI and the Secret Service because of how many threats are coming in. He joins us now, Oakland County Sheriff Michael Bouchard. Sheriff, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Good evening to you. Good evening to you. Thank you. Let me start with these copycat threats because you've laid out already sort of the facts of this, the numbers here. But talk to me about what's behind that. You've put so many resources into the investigation of Tuesday's shooting. And even if most, if not all of these threats are probably not real, I know you can't take that chance. You have to investigate. You have to devote resources to all of them. And I wonder how you know, exhausted or angry or frustrated you are by this, or maybe how concerned that one of these threats does end up maybe being something real. Um, you hit all the adjectives, frustrated, angry, exhausted. Our people are running fast without sleep now for days, working on a real tragedy because we have reams and mounds of evidence we have to find, process, and present to make sure the prosecution uh, goes well and holds this person accountable for the actual shooting. So much of what we've seen, and sadly I predicted this, and we've seen it around the country, you have one actual shooting and tragedy, and everyone gets spiked with all sorts of threats, and almost all of them are completely fallacious. There's no merit to it, and they're not at all credible. But having said that, as you said, we have to investigate. We don't want to leave any stone unturned to miss something that could be a real deal. But so far, none of these threats have yeah. been credible. But we're just being so overrun that I asked our friends at the FBI and Secret Service for their uh cyber folks to help our cyber unit to begin to run some of these down. And most importantly, I want people to understand the mere fact of a, of a threat, that is a crime punishable in our state by 20 years. Mm. So if you're making these false threats and we come after you, you've got some serious punishment coming and we're going to find you because it's raising the anxiety, the tension and the fear within a community that's already raw. And 60 plus schools closing. That seems like a lot to me, Sheriff. Is that not? That's a whole lot. But you, you got to understand right now, so many people are raw, they're afraid, they're nervous, they're anxious. And with all of this proliferation, because the other problem is social media has become this clearinghouse for all this false information yeah. and for posting threats. And then it gets recirculated and recirculated and shared a million times. We've been investigating threats that actually occurred, the threat occurred in 2018 and was deemed non-credible, but now they're being recycled right. and shared. With them. So it's, it's understandable why some school districts said, let's just close our schools, give parents a chance to breathe and allow police to catch up with this and we'll come back anew on Monday. Let me talk to you now about this investigation itself, right? We know that the 15-year-old suspect has been arrested and charged. I know that as of, I think, 24 hours ago, the parents of that teen had not been talking with you, with prosecutors. Has that changed? Just you, And then I have a follow-up, but, like, are they cooperating now in this case? Um, no, they are not okay. talking to us. And uh, they actually advise their child in our state, um, you have to have parental permission to talk to a juvenile, and they refuse that permission. So there's no conversations occurring between us, the suspect, or the parents. I know the prosecutor just said there may be an announcement on potential charges against them in the next 24 hours. Given what you've just said, would you support charges against these parents? Well, we have to finish our packet. The totality of it obviously depends on the criminality, ultimately, that she'll decide charges. So if they, for example, in an abstract hypothetical, if they gave the weapon to this person, it's illegal for someone his age to possess right. or carry a handgun. So if they participate in that, that's clearly a crime and there ought to be charges. But that's something our investigators are running down as best they can factually because the participants are not really talking. Well, that's what I want to ask. Is there evidence to support that they may have done anything criminally wrong? Well, I don't want to open our 
investigative file at this point because that would prejudice any potential charges. But that's exactly what my detectives are looking at. We know that this suspect, this teenager, the student, had videos, at least a video made the night before the shooting. There was a journal. The day of the shooting, he had a meeting with his parents at the school that was on top of, on a different issue, a meeting the day before the shooting happened. Were any of those meetings about the potential for violent behavior, were there any red flags in those discussions? Well, the, the discussions first and foremost happened with school officials, yep. and we were never informed until after the shooting. Um, there was nothing specific as it related to a shooting uh, threat or threats against the school. Okay. Are you, you, I, I couldn't, I don't want to read too much into the sheriff. I watched your news conference yesterday. We carried it live on another show that I do. You seemed um, like you were walking up to the line of being frustrated with the school that they didn't inform you about those meetings earlier. Am I reading that wrong? No, ma'am. Obviously, my my mantra always is share too much, not too little. And obviously, with the with the plus of 2020 hindsight, we would have wished we would have been participants in the meeting or at least informed of the content um, as it happened. If it wasn't related to violent threats, these discussions, can you give us any insight as to what it was related to? What kind of behavior? Well, they, there, there are things within that meeting and within that context that, again, now, since we pivoted to prosecution, I really don't feel comfortable saying it will ultimately probably be part of the court proceedings. Okay. okay. Yeah. I, I respect that. I have to ask. I want to, before I let you go, ask about Certainly. something else. And I know that you have said that there was no evidence that you had seen, at least as of earlier this week, that any of these students tried to stop or were able to stop the shooter, obviously, because this was just such a horrific situation. But I'm sure you've seen some of these reports that one of these these young men, uh, Tate Meyer, football player, teenager, student there, there's, there's eyewitness accounts, at least, or at least, you know, discussions that have been made public, the Detroit Free Press, for example, that he actually rushed the shooter, tried to run toward the shooter when this happened. Do, have you seen any evidence that would support that? Can you tell us more about that? Well, first, I'll say he was an amazing young man, and yeah. it's a huge tragedy, but I, I have to say that we have no evidence that that, in fact, occurred. He is, uh, as you said, was an incredible young man, um, as were, from what I've read and seen, the other three far too young victims of this horrific shooting. Yeah, Sheriff Bouchard. Um, I'm so grateful to you for your time. I know this has been an unimaginably hard week for you, and I appreciate you giving us the time tonight. Thanks for your... I appreciate it very much. Thank you. In Chicago now, both brothers who say they helped Jussie Smollett stage a phony hate crime. They're testifying now in Smollett's trial. Olavinjo Osundaro took the stand this afternoon after his brother, Abimbola, and began talking about how he says the actor recruited him for this phony attack. Earlier, the defense had gone after the brother, saying that the two of them attacked Smollett because they wanted a job as his private security and they wanted money. Remember, these three guys knew each other before this attack happened. The prosecution got a chance to follow up and try to poke some holes in the defense's claim, asking how Abambola would have known where Smollett was at 2 a.m. during a polar vortex and saying he hasn't worked as an actor since the alleged attack. Maura Barrett is following this trial for us. Maura, this is getting a lot of attention here, right, because of the way uh, that these brothers have, it seems, turned on Jesse Smollett. Talk to us about this. Well, these are two of the key witnesses here in this trial, and they were involved in what they're saying now was a staged attack, and they were two of the only people that were there uh, for it that, that have been testifying, and uh, other than the police that have come in after the fact, and they laid out how they knew Smollett ahead of time. They, so one of the brothers had worked with him on the show Empire, uh, and they did say that Smollett paid them to, to carry out this attack, and they, they detailed text messages before uh, meeting up with him where he detailed where he wanted to do it. Um, and, and how exactly it was done. He said he wanted, they want, he wanted them uh, to punch him in the face, but, quote, not too hard, even detailing details about um, pouring bleach on him mm. and uh, putting a noose around his neck. And so the, the defense really trying to, to hurt their credibility, saying that they, the brothers are, that are homophobic and Smollett is a, a gay black actor, and so they were saying it was a racist, homophobic attack, but obviously a lot of holes there because, like you said, these, these three individuals knew each other before the brothers saying that it was all planned out prior to the attack. More really quickly, any chance we will hear from Jesse Smollett himself during this trial? Any indication that that'll happen? 
Right now, that's a big maybe. Um, it could go through the end of the week or even into next week. And so the big thing, though, uh, that with all of the back and forth over whether or not he will testify is the video evidence that does exist. Police testified earlier this week that there's videos of the brothers meeting ahead of time, doing a dry run even of the attack. And so there's a lot of conversation on whether Smollett testifying would either help or hurt him in this situation because there is so much confusion about the back and forth. And so as a reminder, he's been charged with six counts of felony disorderly conduct uh, for giving yeah. a false report to police on several occasions. Hallie. Maura Barrett live for us on that, along with apparently her CB radio, Maura. We'll figure out what that, that noise is in the mic and get that fixed. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, some developing news just in today. An arrest has been made in the shooting death of music legend Clarence Avant's wife, Jacqueline. Remember, we told you about this yesterday. She was found dead at their Beverly Hills home, and we've just gotten a new update from police. Aaron McLaughlin's in L.A. with more details on all of it. Plus, some breaking news out of the NFL just now. Antonio Brown suspended for three games for, quote, misrepresenting his vaccination status. More details on what this means for him and the team coming up. So some news from out west here where Beverly Hills police have said they've arrested a suspect after the killing of Jacqueline Avon. Remember yesterday we told you they said she may have been a target. Well, now they're not so sure. It's looking like it's too early for them to pin down a reason why this happened. But we are getting some new details. Avon was shot early yesterday morning in her home in Beverly Hills. She is a very well-known philanthropist in the area. She's the wife of Rock and Roll Hall of Fame music producer Clarence Avon. You might know him from the Netflix documentary, The Black Godfather. There's also been so much love for Jacqueline on social media. Oprah Winfrey posted this, saying she's the classiest, kindest, and most calming presence, adding, the world is upside down and deeply in need of some love today. Aaron McLaughlin is following the story from Los Angeles. Aaron, bring us up to speed here, right? Police arrested a suspect. They say he hasn't been booked yet, though, because apparently he shot himself in the foot. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. The suspect literally shot himself in the foot accidentally with a rifle, no less, that according to police, he was arrested that same night across town in Hollywood in the backyard of another high-priced home in connection with a suspected burglary. Police apprehended him with the gunshot wound. He's been identified as 29-year-old Ariel Maynor, a parolee with a criminal history. It's unclear how or if the two crimes are connected. Hmm. Police are still investigating motive. This is a new police chief, by the way. Just got sworn in this week, now dealing with this in Beverly Hills, but saying this seems to be, at least right now, the end of any kind of, of threat, right? Well, police say he's the only suspect at this point, and they had this message for the community. Take a listen. This is one of the most protected and patrolled cities in the world. Crimes of any kind will not be tolerated here. Let this be a message to anyone thinking of committing a crime in Beverly Hills. You will be caught and brought to justice. That said, this is alarming. Crime is on the rise here in Los Angeles. Homicides are up 47 percent the last two years alone, given the trend, the fact that they have this one suspect right. is small comfort to people who live here in L.A. When you talk about the Avons, they have had an enormous influence, you know, not just in music. Their daughter was an ambassador to the Bahamas. We heard Oprah, you know, expressing how sad and how grieving she was after this. So many other big names that are really paying tribute to Jacqueline today. Yeah, we've also heard from former President Bill Clinton. Let me just read you what he posted on Twitter saying, Jackie Avant was a wonderful woman, a great partner to Clarence and mother to Alex and Nicole, an active citizen and a dear friend to Hillary and me for 30 years. She inspired admiration, respect and affection in everyone who knew her. We are heartbroken. She will be deeply missed. We also heard from Stevie Wonder, who had this to say on a podcast. She is truly one of God's children. She showed it in her everyday spirit. And that's what is making me want to cry. So it's very clear that she was a much-loved member, not only of the Beverly Hills community, but across the country. That is so clear. Erin McLaughlin, thank you so much for bringing us that live from L.A. Appreciate it. We want to bring you on update to a story that we've been following and that we told you about, actually, right here on this show. The fraternity that hosted what turned out to be a deadly fight night charity boxing match suspended for now. 
Remember this one? This was the frat out of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. They're now saying the Kappa Sigma is no longer a student organization while they investigate what happened. The young man you see on your screen right now, 20-year-old Nathan Valencia, died at the hospital from brain injuries he got during his fight that night. His parents, others around him, people in the community have questioned what safety procedures were in place. Coming up here on the show, two Georgia election workers say they were targeted in a campaign of lies during the 2020 election, harassed, even forced to move out of their house. Now they're suing the conspiracy website they say was behind it all. Ben Collins joins us with that backstory in just a little bit. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, today, the U.S., the European Union, and other allies hit dozens of officials and companies in Belarus with new sanctions. It's part of a pressure campaign against Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko. The U.S. and other Western countries say his last election win was fraud and that the country started a border crisis with Poland as a political attack. Number two, another high-level exit from Vice President Harris's office. Sources say the VP's chief spokesperson and senior advisor, Simone Sanders, will be leaving her position. Last month, Harris's communications director, Ashley Etienne, also announced her departure. Number three, a British judge is now ruling that a letter Meghan Markle wrote to her estranged father was personal and private, and that a British tabloid had zero business publishing any of it in 2018. In a statement, Markle said this legal win isn't just a victory for her, but for anyone scared to stand up for what's right. Number four, debt collectors sliding into your DMs. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau says it is legal. Debt collectors can now use social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, to send direct messages to borrowers who owe money. So be careful when you look to see who's in there. Number five, Toys R Us maybe making a comeback? Remember it closed all of its stores in the U.S. a few years ago? It's had some pop-ups since then, but now it's opening a whole new location, a permanent one in New Jersey this month, just in time for holiday shopping. The company says it'll have a two-story slide and an ice cream parlor. Okay. We got some breaking news now out of the sports world. Antonio Brown of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers getting suspended for three games with no pay for, quote, misrepresenting his COVID vaccine status. Do you remember this story? We told you about it a few weeks ago. It was sort of bizarre. There were these reports that he bought a fake vaccine card, right, that his vax card just wasn't real. Well, the NFL looked into it. Brown is now suspended. Our friends at NBC Sports say he's accepted his discipline and will not appeal the fine that's coming with the suspension. NBC sports columnist Peter King is making his debut on the show. Peter, it's so good to have you. Good evening to you. Thanks, Allie. Hi. This is, a, this is one with a lot of twists and turns, right? Because Brown, through his lawyer, through his head coach, had originally, I think, denied the stories that he had this fake, va this fake vaccine card. But now he's been suspended and he's accepting it. So what's the deal? You know, in our country right now, Hallie, if you're a famous person and you deny, 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 a lot of people believe you. But the thing about these vaccination cards, as I'm sure you know, is that when you go get vaccinated, there is a site where you got vaccinated and there is a batch number. Okay. This is trackable, that you, Peter. That, you, you, that know? you ingested, you know, through a needle. And so it's pretty easy, quite honestly, to check the vaccination card that a player, in this case, Antonio Brown, would have used to phony up his vaccination status. And, you know, a lot of people will say, I mean, big deal, so what? He's a professional athlete. Even if he gets COVID, it's not going to be that bad. This is all about the community mm. that you live in. You know, you're around 70 players every day. You're around 25 coaches. You're around 30 front office people and staff. You know, if if everyone lied about their vaccination status and you're all going out at night in the state of Florida and having fun and doing whatever, do you actually think that nobody would get COVID? And so it's just a matter of common respect and decency. <clears throat> and he didn't he did not follow it. I have to read what the Bucks are saying now, right? The statement from Tampa Bay that, quote, we appreciate the league's timely handling of this matter and recognize the importance of the health and safety protocols that have been established. We will continue to implement all league COVID protocols. Is the team going to face anything here, Peter? Because, you know, Antonio Brown plays for them. Like, are they on the hook? Are they on the line for any sort of punishment here? 
Probably not, because, Hallie, when, when players came forward and said, I've been vaccinated, they had to produce their vaccination cards. I see. So every team in the NFL keeps these vaccination cards on file. I don't believe that for, let's say, 175 employees of an organization, or 175 to 200 in an organization, I don't believe that a team was required to check whether the vaccination actually had been done. And in fact, I'm not sure they could check it right. in, in every case because of HIPAA laws. But I don't think the Bucks are going to get any uh, sanction like Brown did. Does this whole saga with Antonio Brown say anything to you, like bigger picture, of where, as we look at all these stories you've been covering of football players and vaccinations and COVID, like, does it say anything to you, big picture, about where, how the league is handling these COVID protocols? Like, are you able to draw any big conclusions from this? Or in your view, is this like a one-off thing? It's only Antonio Brown, and that's that. When you're a big star... The rules sometimes, uh, I'm not saying they get bent, but I'm saying that there isn't quite the fervor, uh, you know, to go after the biggest stars. And that's why, and again, they did go after Antonio Brown. But I believe, I believe Tampa Bay, who already had him on a two-strikes policy, mm. one strike and you're out, I believe they're going to overlook this. Now, if Antonio Brown was a, a, the sixth receiver on the team, they'd probably say, oh, you fake your vaccination status, get out of here. He's Tom, one of Tom Brady's favorite targets. Right. They're not cutting Antonio Brown, I don't think. And it's because, you know, the privileged guys, the big stars, get more rope than the lesser guys. Peter King, um, it's really great to have you on to talk through all of this. We couldn't ask for a better voice on this. Peter, thank you. Please come back. Uh, hope okay, to see you. Okay, Allie, again. thank you. Thanks. Time now to get to the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, we're looking at two election workers in Georgia whose lives were turned, no joke, totally upside down. Why? Because of this far right election conspiracy theory. They say they've had to change their phone numbers, they've had to delete their accounts online, and just generally, have been living with this fear for their safety, especially after strangers at least twice tried to come into their home to, quote unquote, make a citizen's arrest. This is bonkers stuff. So how do they become targets? Ruby Freeman was falsely accused of, quote, counting illegal ballots from a suitcase stashed under a table by the site The Gateway Pundit. Well, now, Freeman and her daughter are filing a suit against the twin brothers who run this site. Freeman's name started appearing in articles when the site ID'd her on a surveillance video from a Georgia voting center. In December of last year, a Trump campaign lawyer looked at this video and claimed that this video was evidence of voter fraud. A month after those articles came out, former President Trump referred to Freeman by name on his call with Georgia's Secretary of State. Freeman says these accusations are false. They're part of a campaign of lies to create doubt about the integrity of the vote. And again, just to be clear here, this was a, an image of her... It became known as this idea that this suitcase of ballots had suddenly appeared. In actuality, what had happened was they were counting ballots, put them away, were asked to start recounting again. That's the backstory here. The Gateway Pundit has not responded, by the way, to NBC's request for comment. But Ben Collins covered the story and is here with me now. Um, ben, it's good to have you on for the backstory tonight. Thank you, friend. Thank you. So in the backstory, we try to get a sense from our reporters of like how they find these stories, how you cover these stories. Right. And apparently the first time you emailed Ruby Freeman was this week last year. Right. Like you, she was on your radar long before this, I assume, because of these these allegations of fraud. Yeah, I just checked. The first time I called Ruby was 363 days ago. Wow. Uh, I, I called her, uh, and her voicemail was so sweet. It was about how, um, you know, it's about how, you know, she goes by the grace of God and all this stuff. And, you know, by the way, buy some of my purses. It was very sweet. She she ran a mall kiosk where she sold purses because she was a retired 911 operator. And uh, Shay Moss, who's her daughter, is an election worker, and uh, a lot of people were either uh, sick with COVID or afraid of COVID around at the time of the election last year. So people were sort of dropping out of counting ballots in Atlanta. So uh, Shay called her mom and said, hey, do you want to do some public service? Do you want to come by? You'll get paid a little bit. Do you want to be a temp uh, in counting ballots in Atlanta? And that's what happened. Um, she was on some security camera footage uh, taking, literally, just you just see her just take some some ballots from underneath the table and placing them on a table. 
And uh, in the Trump ecosystem, uh, when they were combing through 14 hours of security camera footage trying to find something nefarious looking, that's the best they could find. They, they said this woman who had ruby on her shirt uh, must have been a Democratic operative, and uh, her life turned into sheer hell for the next year. And you say sheer hell. You've covered so much hellish stuff. I, th I think that's the only way that's fair yeah. to describe it. Viewers want you cover Q. You cover all sorts of sort of fringy, weird internet stuff, right? How does this compare to stuff you've covered before? Because the idea that people come knock on your door and say, "I'm going to arrest you. I'm going to make a citizen's arrest." I mean, that is extreme stuff. She had to actually move out of her house at one point. How does this compare to the reporting that you've done on other people who have been targeted by conspiracy theorists? This is probably the worst I've seen it in terms of, uh, you know, this person just did not deserve this. This person did literally nothing wrong. She was trying to do a public service at the request of someone who needed help. And uh, her she could not uh, live in her home anymore. On January 6th, when people were storming the Capitol, there were some people at Ruby Freeman's house. They had bullhorns. They were outside of her house, both on foot and in vehicles, trying to get her to come out. But she had fled because the FBI told her to flee. The local police didn't take this seriously enough. They didn't say, uh, didn't give her any help. They said it would have been, I guess, like expensive to do it. Um, this woman did not deserve what, what happened to her. Her grandson, uh, Shay's son, uh, this was during the pandemic, so he was doing homework on, on his phone's hotspot. And they had to turn that off because he was getting enough death threats from these people mm. uh, that he could no longer do his homework anymore. So uh, this woman made uh, this woman made one movement <laughs> with her arms once, and this is what happened to her life for the next year. Yeah, um, it was totally ridiculous. And uh, you know, I've seen the pizza gating of people and all this other stuff. Uh, it, the, some of those people are you know quasi political people, but this woman didn't deserve this at all. She was just trying to do the right thing, and the opposite happened to her. Ben Collins, um, it's a horrific story, and it's so important, I think, to shine a spotlight on the misinformation and the conspiracy theories that are out there. I appreciate you doing that. I appreciate you coming on to tell us the backstory. Thank you. Coming up sure. here on the show, check out this smooth criminal, a thief who had a very interesting approach to trying to th steal thousands of dollars from a salon. Uh, is he doing the worm? I don't know. He'll probably have to wash his clothes. He's being called the snake burglar. We'll talk about that in a second. Plus. We know climate change is hitting California really hard, but just how much is it actually costing the state? Steve Patterson breaks it down in tonight's original. If I asked you to put a price on climate change, what would you say? Millions? Billions? What about the effect on jobs and businesses? Steve Patterson breaks down the cost of the climate crisis in California in tonight's original. But first, NBC News covers hundreds of stories each day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what the TELUS is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our L.A. Bureau, a snake on the loose, not the kind you think. Take a look at this surveillance video of a man who quite literally slithered through a salon while stealing $8,000 in cash. I mean, police are still looking for this guy. They say he may have tried to hit some other local businesses before today. But listen, this is not Mission Impossible. Like, stand up, you know? From our Southeast Bureau. Tesla can officially call Texas its new home. The company left its Silicon Valley headquarters for a factory under construction in Austin. CEO Elon Musk has been hinting about this move ever since he had this fight with Alameda County in California over reopening one of his factories right at the start of the pandemic. And from our Midwest Bureau, the Home Alone house outside Chicago could be yours for one night only, you filthy animal. On December 12th, up to four guests will be able to stay at the McAllister family house. And guess what? It's only going to cost you 25 bucks. The listing says your host for the night will be Kevin McAllister's big brother, Buzz, and his pet tarantula. You had me until tarantula. Not going to bid for that now. Thank you, friends. We want to bring you now today's original, a story you may not have seen anywhere else. In California, we're getting a look at just how real the climate crisis is in that state. A new study shows the Sierra Nevada snowpack could disappear in just 25 years. And listen, this is a big impact to huge, huge reservoirs of water, like the key thing for people who live there. Steve Patterson went to Lake Tahoe, spent some time there talking about how businesses have had to adapt to survive because of climate change. Watch. California is wondrous. A sprawling state filled with natural beauty. People from across the world flock to the Golden State every year to escape. But it's a landscape in trouble. 
with rising temperatures from Palm Desert, where the number of 85 degree plus days from November till April is projected to increase up to 150 percent by the end of the century. To the Sierra Mountains, where they could see about a quarter of the days below freezing they do now by 2100. Marshall Burke studies environmental science at Stanford. I think the tourism industry in California and really throughout the U.S. West uh, should be worried. They need to take this seriously. Extreme heat caused by climate change in California could cost anywhere from 50 to 80 billion dollars per century. The Lake Tahoe region, a place almost entirely dependent on tourism, is on edge. This year, the Caldor fire turned South Lake Tahoe into a smoky ghost town, costing local businesses more than 90 million dollars. I threw out 12 to $13,000 worth of food. That was just what I threw out, you know, the sales that were lost. I mean, I lost a lot of revenue. Restaurant owner Damasini Chavaria says sales still haven't recovered. It looks like fires are part of our future and just their unpredictability and all that. I think that's probably the most frightening, frightening bit. Meanwhile, on the lake, it's adapt or die. Kelsey Wiest owns and operates Clearly Tahoe, a clear bottom kayak tour company offering stunning views. But the fire, along with shifting temperatures in the lake's erratic water level from years of mega drought, is making it more difficult to attract customers. The low water levels and climate change is certainly not a good thing. Yeah. It's terrifying. We've adapted, but it's a challenge every year to await the conditions and be ready to adapt to those. Scientists say there is no doubt that climate change is raising temperatures in a region like Lake Tahoe, where the weather is so diverse, you could be kayaking on pristine blue waters on the very same day that you're hitting the slopes at a mountainside resort, just like this. And up here, there's not enough snow. Resorts now dedicate thousands to making man-made powder to open the ski season before the holiday. But this year, with temperatures still in the mid-50s, it's been too warm even for that. Tell me about sort of the snow production and, and where you're at and where you'd like to be or would normally be? I think we've only maybe had three or four days of production, which is not enough to open a ski resort on. At Boreal Woodward, adapting has become part of what they call an elastic business model. The resort uses a super cooling pond to fuel snowmaking in this sprawling year-round 33,000 square foot facility offers indoor fun when it gets a little too warm. Working with the weather is at the core of what we do, and we need to plan ahead for weather that's going to be more unpredictable. Even in a new reality of creeping heat and choking smoke, the worsening climate can't dampen the Golden State's appeal, but the science is clear. Unless we get our act together on climate change, all the science suggests we're just going to see more and more of those years uh, in the future. So, so that, to me, is quite worrying. Steve Patterson is here now to talk more about his reporting. Steve, I need to acknowledge right off the bat the hardship assignment that we were able to send you on as you went kayaking and snowboarding <laughs> um, on assignment there. But what's so interesting, listen, you know that I love California. You know that I love Tahoe. Um, talk to me about what you're hearing from people who live there, because it's a tourist site, but it's also a home for so many people that rely on tourists like me coming in and spending time and money there, right, as we talk about the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada disappearing. Well, and I don't think I'm being hyperbolic when I say the snowpack is a massive deal, besides yeah. the obvious of what it does to winter tourism in a place like Tahoe, especially at a ski resort where you need that snow to function. Runoff from the snowpack we get from those mountains, it flows into California's streams, the rivers, and most importantly, those reservoirs that support the state's water supply. So it makes the drought worse, lowers the water level in a place like Tahoe, making yeah. certain areas inaccessible for tours, means less crops for wineries, worsening conditions for wildfires, and all of that stuff directly hits people in their pocketbooks when it comes to travel and tourism. And it hits the Alex. state, too, right? We heard you say it's going to cost the state yep. tens of billions of dollars each century. Clearly, you know, what's been, if you look on a historical level, what's happened so far hasn't helped, right? Hasn't made enough of a difference yet. What's on the horizon that's new that they're going to try to put in place to help get a handle on this? More billions of dollars. Okay. The most direct legislation came in September when the governor signed a $15 billion climate package, $5 billion for emergency drought funding, $1.5 for wildfire prevention, nearly $4 billion for mitigation projects. But the state really has to recognize that water is the key here, and we need more personal responsibility when it comes to water consumption. you got to save your water yeah. when you're here in California. I remember that from my uh, days living in L.A. Steve Patterson, thank you so much. Appreciate it.
Coming up, China on defense right now, dealing with fallout over how Peng Shui is doing. With the International Olympic Committee saying it had a second call with the tennis star. But the Women's Tennis Association pulling out tournaments from the entire country. We're sorting that out ahead. So you know we've been talking about Chinese tennis star Peng Shui on this show. And now there's a new development with the Women's Tennis Association taking a stand. They're making a move against China. They're suspending all the tournaments there for now because Peng Shui basically seemed to disappear after she accused a former vice premier of sexual assault. What's critical here is that we as a world cannot walk away from this. If we did, we're telling everybody that not addressing sexual assault with the respect and seriousness it requires is okay. The WTA's move comes as the International Olympic Committee says they spoke to Peng a second time after this, what you're looking at, this 30-minute video call last month. They say they're going to meet with her in person next month. So a lot of interesting developments. I want to bring in Janice Mackey Fryer, where it is Friday morning in Shanghai. Janice, I'm so glad to have you on. Thank you for being up with us. Um, I got a lot of questions for you, but let me start on this report that we're hearing that a new email was sent to the Women's Tennis Association. What do we know about that? From what we understand, there was apparently a third email that was sent to the WTA, purportedly uh, written by Peng Shui, where she expresses shock to the WTA that it's made this decision that it's going to pull all of the tournaments from China. It's almost impossible to confirm whether she actually wrote that email, because like any of the correspondence that's come before, there's some question about its credibility. Uh, in this case, this email was, again, uh, not uh, released by the WTA. Uh, it was uh, released and, and shown on the Twitter account of a state media employee uh, claiming that she wrote it. So the email is apparently out there. But again, Hallie, there's, there's a lot of questions. Yeah. Uh, around this and basically everything uh, when it comes to Peng Shui to, yeah. to get a real uh, credible read on her well-being and her safety. You say credible, and I think that's important here because we know the IOC has said, okay, we've talked to her twice, right? They've had these conversations. You know, they're saying, yeah. oh, okay, things are fine. The WTA is like, we don't, it seems like the WTA is saying, we do not trust that. We do not buy that, right? Is there a conflict here? Am I overreading that? Well, there's definitely a disconnect, and and over the past couple of weeks, since you know this has really been building some momentum, there was the sense that the the IOC was being used as leverage against the WTA. Mm. We asked Steve Smith about that. He said he wasn't going to comment directly, um, but he did acknowledge that he does believe that even those calls with the with the IOC have been quote unquote orchestrated um, in this second instance they didn't release a photo of the video call uh, like they did the first time it, it came about you know, only after the WTA's decision that the IOC acknowledged that they had this second call. They gave no indication as to who was in on that call. The first one, of course, was with IOC President uh, Thomas Bach. But the IOC is saying that they, they reached out to give Peng ongoing support, uh, that they have been in touch with her, that they've agreed they're going to have a personal meeting mm. in January. But again, there's no transcript that's being offered and certainly no video of that call. Janice Mackey Frere, live for us there from Shanghai. Janice, I so appreciate you being on. I could ask you 400,000 more questions about this, but that'll have to be it for tonight. Thank you, thank <laughs> you, and thanks to all of you for watching this hour. There's going to be a lot more of this show here for you tomorrow. Same time, same place. See you then. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.